Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's session on Steel Central Transaction Analyzer. One thing to note is this product was formerly known as App Transaction Expert or ATX. My intent for today's session is for new users who recently purchased or possibly even downloaded the product on eVail to get up and running on day one take captures, import those captures, and perform some basic analysis on those captures. Without any further delay, let's get started. All right, so on-demand capture. On-demand capture starts with the transaction analyzer user interface, which is what we're looking at right here. Now, one of the first things you're probably noticing is that it has the name of OpNet, an app transaction expert. Well, this tool is a legacy OpNet tool and was acquired by Riverbed in the acquisition of OpNet back in 2012. This tool used to be called App Transaction Expert or ATX, but no, today this goes as Steel Central Transaction Analyzer. So we'll start the uh, on demand capture. And the first thing you're going to want to do is open up the Capture Manager. Now, doing this, allows us to configure the endpoints that we want to run a capture on and get that whole configuration part started for uh, connecting to those endpoints. We want to make sure that when we're doing an on-demand capture that we're in the on-demand capture tab. So at this point we can begin to add the endpoints for which we want to take captures from. And if you're used to Wireshark, there's a little bit of pain sometimes associated with setting up and uh, taking those captures in that We've got to make a configuration on a production piece of gear there in the form of uh, configuring a source port and a destination port. We need a laptop to plug into the destination port to receive the packets off from that port. So some of that can be cumbersome. If you've got a pretty tight change control process, that can even take days to get the change through and then set up the capture. And by the time you get that going, the, the symptom may be gone and unable to reproduce. So. Uh, Having this solution, this agent-based solution, makes that uh, capture process much more agile process uh, and easier to set up and also easier to just uh, maintain and import those files. So to do that, I've got my laptop already configured as a test candidate here. And we're going to use it to show some of that workflow for starting those captures and importing and then uh, taking a look at the capture. So if this was not here, we would hit the Add Agent button. And what you'll see is it looks like so. But I'm going to, since I already have my machine set up here, I'm going to select it and then choose to edit that agent. So this looks the exact same as the interface for to, if you were just to add a brand new agent. The key points here being uh, one of the first things you want to do to connect to that endpoint, and also let me back up a little bit, in order for this to happen, in order for me to connect to an endpoint, to my laptop or any other endpoint in the field, whether it be at a branch location or in your data center, um, I have to have an agent set up on that machine. And we typically have an agent to support any version of operating system out there, whether it be Mac, Windows, uh, Linux. We've got uh, quite a few different assortments of agents. So once that agent's set up, I then come in here to my Capture Manager, and I want to add that agent. So the endpoint address for which I've just installed that agent, I want to specify in this hostname field. I can add the IP address or the DNS name if I have all of my, uh, my endpoints that I'm going to add here in DNS. I can connect to them via their DNS name also. I can add a description. However, this is not required for this to work. Uh, one thing to note here is that the default port for communication from your central console to this endpoint is going to be TCP 27401. So I have a console on my laptop that I'm using to connect to these endpoints. We have to have, uh, if you've got a firewall between where you sit and your users that you want to run captures from, you just have to make sure that you uh, poke a hole in that firewall over TCP 27401. Uh, another field that you're going to want to configure here is this maximum size of packet data to store. This defaults to, I believe, 65535. And this is just telling, asking us how much of the packet do you want to capture? If I wanted to capture header only, maybe just looking, I'm not interested in the payload field of the packet, but I'm just interested in the headers, I might type in 100 to tell the tool, catch just the first 100 bytes, which usually 100 bytes should contain the header. Your header may vary in size depending on the transport that you're coming across, but 100 is usually a pretty safe value to uh, make sure you're catching everything in that header. But I'm going to, for this demonstration, capture the full payload because uh, I'm going to want to look into that payload to verify 
uh, the, the leg of the conversation that got the call to my endpoint for which I'm about to demonstrate. So we're going to leave that at 1500. Um, we also have this kernel buffer size field. I'm not going to mess with that. I typically leave that at the default. But this field I do modify. This is the maximum number of packets to capture field. And this will default to 100,000. Now that's okay unless your transaction that you're trying to capture has more than 100,000 packets. Let's say the transaction I want to capture has 200,000 packets. And if I leave this default, then the tool will automatically stop capturing after 100,000 packets. So the first thing I do is change this to minus one, which means infinite. Allow me to uh, specify when I want to stop and start the capture. So the, the tool will not automatically stop at any point. We also have some filter options here. If I wanted to uh, set up a filter here, maybe I'm only maybe I'm only concerned about one other particular endpoint talking to the source that I'm connecting uh, or capturing from. I can specify that endpoint address. Maybe I only care about web traffic, so I'm going to include port 80 or 443 as part of that filter. Uh, but in this scenario, I do not want to do that. I want to capture everything and then filter after the fact. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to leave the filter alone for this. Um, if I wanted to, let's say I'm I'm running traces with a user that's halfway across the globe and there are five or ten megs a piece and I'm going to run ten of them. Well sometimes importing that, as soon as I hit the finish button in this capture, it's going to import the file. And sometimes importing that across the WAN, especially if I have a small network link, might take a while. It might take me 30 seconds to two or three minutes depending on the transaction size. So what I've often done is I'll tell the tool, leave my files on the remote host until I'm done running all of my scenarios and then once I'm completed with this user, I'll import them all as a bundle so we don't have to wait a couple minutes between each scenario it's just one wait time once they're finished they'll usually maybe go away and do something else while I'm importing the files or they don't even have to go away they can continue working while I'm importing them so that's just a nice option to have there uh, we have a couple of other uh, data sources that we can leverage to import traffic from uh, we've got a few things you can see here we can import from WAN accelerators we have an app response expert which is an appliance that's uh, capturing packets in the middle of your network all the time I'm not going to spend too much time or any time on these today, but I may address those in a follow-up session. The last thing you want to do, once you've configured all these parameters, is you'll have the option now to connect to the endpoint. So by clicking this button here, this specify button, if I could get a list of interfaces now on that endpoint, that means I've successfully been able to connect. And in this case, I'm going to connect to my 10.0.2 interface because that's my wireless interface. Now if I was unable to connect to this, that typically uh, one of three reasons. It would be maybe because there's not an agent installed on that endpoint, or maybe the agent's not running, or two, maybe there's a firewall between you and that endpoint and 27401's not open, or maybe there's even a local firewall on that machine <clears throat> that's preventing 27401 from getting through. And In that scenario, typically I would just add the exception in the local client firewall and uh, everything's okay after that. But in this scenario, we are able to connect, so that's a good sign. This includes server data option. That is not checked by default, and you don't have to check it. But if you do check that box, what that means is it's going to, as I'm taking this network capture, it's also going to look at my system processes. It's going to look at my processor percentage. It's going to look at free memory and a couple of other metrics that we can talk a little bit about. So I'll, I'll go ahead and check this. It doesn't hurt to check it, and it's just a good thing, I think, to add on to this session to talk about some of the different options we have when uh, collecting data. So we've set up the, the agent on the endpoint at this point, and I'm going to select OK. So now we can see that we have it in our list. Now also know that I can have as many of these agents as I want in my Capture Manager. And the nice thing about that also is if I've got five or six hosts that I'm constantly using, but maybe I have another project where I don't use them, I can save that agent list to include all five or ten or however many of those servers are uh, underneath the project name that's relevant to them. So if I ever want to bring all five of those back, I can just say load agent list, and it'll say, okay, where's your agent list file? I select that agent list file, and I've got all of those sources that were originally part of that uh, list configuration. And then I can, by checking the box here that's next to each of those IP addresses or host names, it will automatically, when I hit the start button, start the capture on each of those nodes, provided there's an agent there and I can access it. As soon as I stop that capture, it's going to import the traffic from that endpoint back to my central console for analysis. So in this scenario, I only have one machine, my laptop. So what I'm going to do here, but before I do, I want to talk a little bit about capture download settings. I think this is a good idea to start thinking about um, your file 
organization strategy early on so that you can keep uh, a good management structure for your files. If you're working with a lot of customers doing a lot of different projects, your trace files can add up quickly. So I've found that it's pretty important to develop a good file management strategy early on in your work. And this here um, user interface allows you to do that. So I have a location. I'm just going to leave it at that for now. But I did want to mention that uh, it's important to understand where you're placing your files and keep track of them and manage them efficiently. So now we have, we're going to set up a capture. And I'm just going to run a little uh, a network capture. I'm going to go to Wireshark. And call it Wireshark and I'm going to start my capture. Now when I start the capture notice a couple things up here change. My status changes to capturing so that means I have an active, an active capture currently running. If I want to check the status of that there's a little update status button in the bottom left of the capture manager. I can hit update status and I can see I so far collected 54 packets. I'm not doing much on my box right now so I wouldn't expect a lot of uh, packets to be incrementing here so that's uh, about in line with what I'd expect. So let's go ahead and open my browser here and I'm just going to go to wireshark.com just to generate some traffic. So now that we've opened that page when I hit update status my pages should increment a fair amount and it does. So we can see here now I've got 169 packets that have been accepted this this packet is running um, and the transaction is completed, so I'm now going to finish the capture. But I also have the option to abort capture. If I had the user executing a scenario and, and they misfired, they clicked the wrong button, or for some reason it didn't complete as expected, I could abort that capture and it would not import anything. I could just re-tee it up and then start my capture when I was ready, or when that user was ready. But in this case, I have completed the scenario. To my satisfaction, I'm going to click Finish Capture. When I do that, we see a couple more things happen here. It tells us the capture is completed how many packets were accepted, how many bytes were received, and it also tells us the location of that file in case you forgot or didn't know in the first place this will help you out and tell you where that file is at. And notice the file extension for uh, the captures that we run with the transaction analyzer have a .app capture file extension. But another important thing to note here is that we don't have to have files that were taken from the transaction analyzer to put in this tool for analysis. We can also receive uh, files that were taken from Wireshark or any other uh, sniffer out there that um, supports the file formats that we're able to import. And those typically fall in the range of CAPS, PCAPS, uh, PCAP, NG. So a lot of your common uh, sniffer file formats are supported with the transaction analyzer. So in this case, we've got the, the trace. We've imported it to our tool. Now we want to go take a look at that trace. So we're going to close out of the Capture Manager, go back to the transaction analyzer user interface, and we're going to open that file. In this case, I want to open a single capture in the transaction analyzer. But also know that I have the ability to open simultaneous captures. So for instance, if I have a multi-tier application that has a web app, um, client web app DB type of tier structure, four tiers, or three tiers, uh, maybe I want to put an agent on my client and then also on my app tier because from my client, uh, I can see the web conversation. From my app tier, I'm also going to see that client app to web and also app to database so by merging the client and app to your trace I'll get that uh, that complete visibility which is great for end-to-end -end troubleshooting. But in this scenario I'm not going to do that. I've only got one trace. We're not going to talk about these other types that we support. Today we're just going to talk about the single capture. So let's go ahead and import that and notice here I've got a number of captures and this is the one we just took, the Wireshark trace. Um, but also notice if there were PCAPs in here or CAP files, they would be shown also and I could import them from a different uh, uh, sniffer. So let's go ahead and open that Wireshark trace. So we're going to go through and it's going to tell me that it sees one of the conversations, at least one in the list, um, is HTTPS or SSL. And if I have the SSL key at this point, I can enter that key, which will give me visibility into the payload of those packets. Uh, if I don't have the key, I can just proceed without it and they will be uh, encrypted so I won't get visibility in the payload, but I can still get a lot of information around flow and performance and uh, the things that I'm, I care about for this scenario. So continue without key. I now have the option to apply some additional filters. Um, these are by default set up, but I'm not going to apply any of those right now. I want to take a look at the raw capture and then filter out as needed. Here we're looking at the tree view of the conversation, but right now that the trace is still pretty messy, so I'm not going to um, put a lot of attention into this. I find this is a lot more valuable once I've uh, isolated down to the traffic that I care about. 
So here's where I usually start when I'm doing my analysis in the uh, transaction analyzer. So when you first import the trace, you're going to come to, uh, this is called the tier pair circle. And I like the tier pair circle because it helps me quickly find out uh, where's my relevant conversations at. Because it's going to color code them by volume of traffic. So as we can see here, over on the right, we've got a legend. And these darker blue colors indicate heavier volumes of traffic in the conversation. And this is per direction because I've chosen the app data bytes per direction. But we can also see the lighter volumes of traffic um, by color as well. So immediately I can see, okay, these guys have no traffic or very little. It's maybe keep alive or just something. Uh, maybe I'm connected to a shared drive or something else that I'm not using right now, but the connection remains open. So in this case, I'm guessing that this is the transaction to Wireshark. Well, and it's because I went there before and I've named it, so that does help me out. But even if I didn't have it named, I could tell just by the volume of traffic there. Now, one of the things about these names is that I have the option to name them, and I did just name this one Wireshark, or if it was just the IP address, it would show up as an IP address, but then it would give me the option to look that name up via DNS. So if I have this IP address in my DNS, uh, it would resolve then to the fully qualified host name. But it depends if you're presenting something to an audience where maybe the fully qualified doesn't make a lot of sense to them, you may want to manually name it to something that uh, is common to your organization and does make sense to your audience. So in this case, I think this is Wireshark, but I want to verify that first. So I'm going to go to what we call show streamed bytes for selected items. So what that does is it's scraping the payload of all the packets that I have in that trace, and it's putting them in a little bit more human-friendly, uh, readable format. So when I come here, I'm looking at that connection that was the dark blue that I think is my connection. I'm looking at the first TCP connection. And right away I see getwireshark.com. So this confirms that this is in fact the leg of the conversation that got my call. And so this is the one that maybe I, I care about and I don't care so much about the others. So one of the nice things I can do now is that I can filter everything else out. By right clicking on here, I can either exclude others or I can permanently delete others. Now let's talk a little bit about the differences there. If I exclude others, that leaves me with just the conversation that I was interested in. Now if, I'm, if I get down the road of my analysis uh, a couple minutes from now and I realize maybe I do care about one of those other conversations. I wanted to see, it seems like there's maybe a dependency on something and I believe it to be one of those conversations I deleted. I can right click in the tier pair circle here and say include excluded tier pairs and it brings them all back. Now if I were to choose delete selected items, I don't get that option to bring them back. So in this scenario, I'm pretty sure I don't care about the other tiers, the other conversations, so I'm going to go ahead and permanently delete others, which is going to leave me only with my Wireshark conversation. So at this point, I've got a couple of features in the Transaction Analyzer that I want to talk about a little bit. First of all, if I click up this little preview pane, by clicking on the transaction, I get some visibility into the packets, and I can see uh, my sin, sin, I can see my three-way handshake and a couple of other things. I can scroll through that. And I kind of like that. Uh, sometimes I don't want that because I want more real estate in my tier pair circle. But I like the tier pair circle because not only are we getting the app data per direction, but I also have the option to pivot to a lot of other uh, metrics that are very relevant to, to the performance of the scenario we're looking at. Like response time, for instance, 182 milliseconds. That's pretty quick. Um, it did take long to bring that page back. I've got... I can look at my app turns. How many app turns did it take for to retrieve that amount of data? Uh, I can look at my latency here. I've got about 14 and a half milliseconds between me and my Wireshark endpoint. I can look at protocol information. It's HTTP. So we can see here we've got a lot of different options that are very valuable when we're trying to troubleshoot or track down performance issues. So let's see, let's take a look at something else. If I want to look at this conversation, if you're used to, maybe you're used to using Wireshark and you like packet decodes, I have the option to right click, I click on that conversation, then right click, and I can say show protocol decodes for selected items. And it brings me up in my protocol window. So if you're used to looking at packets, this is a very common view. You've got all of your uh, different information that's relevant to, to your packet decode view. Um, let me see here few other options here that if I wanted to recode this as some other protocol, maybe it's uh, I'm running HTTP over a non-standard port and the tool is not picking it up as HTTP, I can click on that conversation, go to recode as, 
and choose the conversation that I want to recode and then it's giving me the option to recode it as a couple of different uh, uh, protocols. So That's a nice feature also. So let's say I want to look at this transaction on the wire and uh, see how it's performing, look at dependencies, maybe find areas of delay. Uh, the data exchange chart is a great place for that. Uh, I like the data exchange chart because it helps us understand how the transaction looks on the wire. In this case, it's kind of everything smooshed up to the top. I've got my tiers over to the right. I've got a timeline up top. But before I do anything, I want to right click and say full zoom. A full zoom is going to show me the entire transaction. And in this case, it was a very small, very short transaction. But it's, if, if we have a multi tier application, or if even if there is a lot more activity going on in this transaction, uh, it's nice to be able to see some of that in this data exchange chart. And I think I'll show a an example of when the data exchange chart um, is nice, it's very helpful. I'm going to open up a trace here that I think is a good example. And I think, let's see, I'm going to go with, and to do that, I just went to this little open folder. I can open up another transaction while I have this transaction open. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to open up, and this is in one of our uh, model directories that comes with the documentation of the product. You get a lot of sample traces in there with you. So if you don't have any of your own trace files, it gives you a couple that come with the tool to just get you up and running and taking a look at some of the different uh, features of the tool. So I'm going to use, in this case, three-tier Oracle application just because I think it does a nice job of showcasing some of the data exchange chart uh, functionality. So as we can see here, i got a client on the right who talks to an app tier who then talks to a database server. So I can see in the data exchange chart here when that client made the call down to the app tier the app tier then responds with, hey, I, I got you, here's my Synac, we're connected. And then from there, we can see the client makes a call to the database, or to the app tier, I'm sorry. Now, if I want to look at dependencies, because we can see there's some periods of time where there's no data traversing the wire here. So that's we're going to attribute that to processing, typically. But to kind of point that out a little better, we've got this Show Dependencies button here. And when I click that, I can see right away where all those dependencies are, where that processing delay is. So if we look at the colors of these lines, we can see a couple of V's here. That V on that line is pointing to that tier, that application tier is being the source of delay. Up here I've got a couple of lines that are pointing to the client as a source of delay. But down below we can see the legend. The white colors represent application delay or processing on a tier. The light blue colors represent network delay. There's some form of delay in the propagation of, of those packets across the wire. So the tool points out and helps you separate where do I have processing delay versus where do I have network delay. And then there's a user think time value also. And that's not relevant in this scenario, but that becomes relevant if we have, uh, if we're taking a trace from a user and there's multiple steps in the trace, and maybe at each of those steps that user is prompted with some form of dialogue that they need to make a selection before the transaction will move forward. Uh, and maybe that delay, their think time, they're thinking about that selection for four seconds or more usually. But if I know that the application never takes more than four seconds for any processing gaps, I might want to configure then a user think time of four seconds to say any, any gaps that I see in network communication greater than four seconds, let's attribute to the user think time because that's just my user thinking about the selection that they need to make before the transaction can move forward. So I don't want the tool blaming my user thinking about what they want to select next uh, on the application processing or network delay. It just helps the tool understand better uh, the components of delay so that it can more accurately um, give you some suggestions as to what are those sources of delay. So this is the data exchange chart. I like this a lot because it helps us, like I said, understand who talks to what, how often, what's the frequency of that interaction, how long are the delays when I go to talk to a tier. Uh, our database is looking pretty snappy here. He tends to respond pretty quickly. Uh, also I like this because the colors, the colors represent the different uh, payload sizes in each of these packets. So our dark blues are telling us we're leveraging the entire payload portion of that packet which is 1460 bytes as shown in the legend. And then we also um, have different sizes represented by different colors. Now I also like when I come in here to do this split groups option because what that does is now it adds an arrow to each of these lines to help me better understand the direction of data flow. So I can see here the app tier in this dark blue line, that's gonna, that tells me there's a fair amount of data going on there and it's going in the direction from the app to the database tier. And it's leveraging full size packets, so that's good. And then by clicking on it also, you'll notice when I have the preview pane open, I get visibility into the, each individual packet. 
So that's very handy. There's time and the place when I want that, and then there's a time when I don't care about that, when I just want a little bit more, um, more monitor for getting a better idea of what's happening on the wire. So this is great. It helps me understand Explorer. Maybe I didn't expect a, a poke going back from the um, app tier to the database here, and I can look into that pretty quickly. If I don't have my preview pane open, I can click on the conversation piece that I care about, right-click, and jump right into my protocol decodes. So, ah, oh yeah, that's a keep alive. That's what I thought, and it's happening over the port we'd expect. So it gives you a way to really explore and get a better understanding of how that transaction looks under the hood or on the wire, as I call it. Now we also notice this time bar is currently set to absolute time, or excuse me, set to relative time. So that means when I started the capture, it's time zero, and then the clock just ticks until I hit the finish button. So we didn't, this one didn't run very long, but if I wanted this to reflect absolute time or time of day, I could do that. I could say, show me absolute time, because maybe I was using this to look at a, a symptom that occurred at a certain period of time, and I need to know exactly down to the second uh, the timings because the user wrote down the time and they have um, told me that it happened at 3.30 and 15 seconds. So I want to find as close to that time period as I can to look at the the activity or the application profile around that time period to see what might have been going on that looks unusual or different than when this is working great. So that's the data exchange chart. Uh, we also have this tree view and I'm going to minimize this one and get back to um, the other scenario here. This is back to the Wireshark scenario. But I'm going to go back to Tree View and just kind of look at some of the things that this tells us. I like this view because I kind of think of this as the, like a waterfall view to some extent. It's showing us the different operations that occurred to get that Wireshark page. Here's our get. We can expand that to see the sub-operations that were all part of that call. We can see the timings of each of those sub-operations. Uh, whether they're operated in serial or are they um, leveraging maybe some parallel threading where we can kick off a bunch of processes at one time. So it's kind of a lot of different times and, and scenarios where this is very valuable and can help you with your troubleshooting. It's going to tell us information about each of those operations, how much data was exchanged per operation, a start time, stop time, duration, um, how long did each operation take. So very valuable for troubleshooting and and looking for that needle in the haystack. We can see we've got some images coming back, some custom style sheets. So if, you, if you're used to looking at or have seen a waterfall chart, this is fairly common and, uh, and you're used to that. So let's take a look. We're real quick here, I also wanted to talk about a couple of things. If I want to look at metrics. So I have the ability to bring up maybe application throughput or maybe in-flight data or even TCP advertised windows. I can click on each of those metrics that I'm interested in or all of them and then I have the option to show them outside of the data exchange chart or the option to embed that in the data exchange chart. So let's just look at, for instance, if I choose advertise window and app throughput and I say show but not embed in the data exchange chart. What that does is it allows me to adjust them wherever I want to. So this is nice. I know I've used this when I'm, if I'm putting together PowerPoint and I want to include several different metric graphs, sometimes it's difficult to get visibility into all of them at once if you embed them in the data exchange chart. So I'll have them floating and then take some screenshots. So sometimes I want them floating, but sometimes maybe I want them embedded. So let's take a look at what happens if we embed them in the data exchange chart. Now they show up right over top of the transaction, but you can see they're a little bit, uh, there's not as much room there now. So it's, I usually can fit about two in the window, but if I get three or more, I gotta start scrolling. So in this case, I've got advertise receive window. Maybe I don't need that after all, so I just want throughput. But as we can see, it's nice in that it overlays that metric on top of your transaction. So your throughput lines up when I have activity. If I'm watching a file transfer, I can watch the uh, throughput over time. Maybe some other uh, interactions along with that file transfer occur, and I want to see how that affects throughput. Maybe there's some windowing, so I can see throughput dipping when that window is getting crushed. So this is uh, very helpful, depending on what I'm looking for, to have that metric laid on top of uh, the transaction profile. There's another thing that I can do here. I can remember that we collected that server data. So if I wanted to bring that server data back in, some of those, that process information, I can now say import server data. And I want to bring in server stats from capture agent. So what I'm going to do here is I've got the trace that I just took, which is our one to Wireshark, and it creates a .da file. So the raw capture file is .app capture, but the uh, metric, the server metric or the host metric file that imports along with it is appcapture.da. That's just something to remember. So I'm going to bring that file in now. 
and I'm going to a couple configurables here. I want to uh, select the option that says imported statistics were captured on same machine as trace because that's what we did here. And I'm going to, here's different options of things that I can import. So I'm going to go ahead and keep all those. And now I'm just going to say, okay. And it's going to say, which metrics do you want to be included or view right now? And I've got the access to processor instance, processor time, file read bytes per second, system calls per second, available megabytes, and file write bytes per second. So I'll go ahead and just bring all of them in. But you can see here, you can select which other one, whichever ones are relevant to what you're trying to troubleshoot. And when I bring them in, it brings them, it embeds them in the data exchange chart similar how that other metric that we brought in did. So now I can go and I can watch my processor time over, if this is laid on top now of my transaction as well, so I can see the different operations of my transaction, how they were affecting my system components. So very handy in understanding, hey, if my network tr throughput went down to 8 bits per second, and it was humming along at 30 megs, but all of a sudden my CPU spiked to 100%, and my free memory went to zero, maybe there's some system resource scarcity going on to account for some of that performance degradation. So now that we've went through some basic trace analysis, I'm going to close these out. One of the things maybe we want to look at are maybe this transaction had some performance issues and we're, it's really not clear to us what's going on. So we want to help leverage the tools automated performance um, dissector, as you'll call it. And we call that App Doctor. So this little button up here looks like a prescription on the button. That's called App Doctor. And what this is going to do is it's going to help us break down the different components of delay. So in this case, it's telling me I've got a lot of performance degradation on my laptop, but it's also latency is a big factor and part of the uh, degradation that we're experiencing with this transaction. But remember, the whole transaction only took 183 milliseconds. So these things that are being pointed out are relative to the transaction. If it, it can still point out everything has to take some amount of time. And there are certain factors that are involved in, in every transaction that's out there, no matter how short or how long it is the tool is going to break those components out into some percentage uh, as a whole as it relates to that scenario that we have in the tool. In this case, it's saying processing on my laptop and latency are the big bottlenecks here. It's also, we've got an executive summary tab. But before I do anything, before I trust any of this, I want to go ahead and what you see down here is this refined network effects. So before I can trust the tool to calculate any automatic um, canned views or can suggestions on what's wrong, I want it to accurately understand what's actually in the trace file. So I know one of the things here is that my remote bandwidth will default to a gig. And I know that my uh, connection to the network is not one gig. It's more along the lines of about 30 meg. So I'm going to change this to 30 meg. That's not 3 meg, it's 30 meg. There we go. And then it, the tool automatically picked up the latency because it caught the three-way handshake. And that's typically how we derive the uh, the latency value is through the three-way handshake. My home network's not a gig either. It's only 100 megs, so I'm going to change that. And now everything else looks accurate. If for some reason it did not pick up the latency, but you're able to maybe ping that destination or use some other mechanism, maybe path probe in the tool to, to get the actual latency, you can add that latency value um, manually also. But in this case, it picked up the correct latency value, so I'm going to keep it. So now that we've configured the correct network and bandwidth speed, it's going to recalculate the different components that it were originally uh, pointing out as potential areas of degradation or sources of delay. It will recalculate a little bit. In this case, it didn't recalculate too much. The one difference I do see is that we've got a little chunk of bandwidth now showing up as part of the problem. So again, it's a pretty small transaction, so I wouldn't think bandwidth is too much of a problem. I think we only brought back 100 KB of data. So. Um, not too worried about that there. But we've got a couple of other tabs here also. This executive summary tab is going to kind of give us a high level breakdown of uh, an analysis of the transaction summary, if you will. We've got a diagnosis tab. It's telling us that we've got a little bit of latency that appears to be a bottleneck and a little bit chatty. So that's suggesting maybe, we're, maybe the tool thinks we're taking too many turns or not uh, effectively or efficiently leveraging the entire packet to exchange that data. But that's a nice feature in that if you've got other TCP issues with windowing, it'll point that out. If you've got some naggles going on, it'll tell you that. Congestion, it'll point that out. So a lot of great different categories here that will help us uh, serve as clues in helping us get closer to the source of that delay.
we've got a statistics page very important page here I've found a lot of um, value in this page it's good anytime I'm trying to communicate a story or an idea about uh, a transaction or the differences between two scenarios or just baselining a scenario or or um, trying to determine if if an application is efficient or maybe there's some areas where we can optimize this is a great uh, screen here for showing you all the different stats that are part of that scenario that are relevant to transaction performance so uh, really helpful when you're trying to compare a baseline definitely then we've got a, since this is a HTTP transaction, the tool understands that and it's able to uh, point out the different uh, components of that transaction. So part of why we didn't get uh, too much data on this is because I've went to that site a few times, so much of it was cached in my browser. We've got some 304s, we've got some 200s, so it gives us the different status codes that are happening throughout that transaction. Uh, it's giving us some different metrics around various components of the transaction, so just a little bit more granular view into the transaction from a uh, protocol's perspective. So the App Doctor is very nice in helping us understand those components of delay and helping us figure out uh, where to focus our attention to and helping remediate performance issues. So one other thing that I would like to talk about here real quick is now that we've looked at a lot of views and, and went through and we have a lot of great findings, we want to have a way to share that information to a larger audience. So typically we do that in the form of reports. So I really like the reporting engine from this tool here, and we can access it by going up to this report option from the report menu. And we've got a lot of cool little reports here, especially some of these different reports. I like those a lot if I'm comparing different scenarios. Maybe they're coming from a similar area. Maybe there's we know of no differences, but there's definitely some differences in the transaction. So I can bring both of them in and apply a comparison report, and it'll tell us differences in round turns and application data exchange and the size of the packets and all kinds of things that are relevant to performance and can help us understand those differences, maybe why that performance is different. But in this scenario, I want to just stay on the Generate MS Word Report because this is the way that, probably the easiest way I've found to share all this information that we just went over. The nice thing is we have the ability to include or exclude as many different parts of what we just went through in this report as we want. But for this, I'm going to keep the defaults. I'm going to give it a name and I'll just call it Wireshark demo and I'm gonna say generate and it's gonna ask me where do you want to keep this and for now I'll just go on my desktop where should demo and after about five seconds it should whip up a nice report detailing all of our findings that we just went through and this is something um, I often would send out to different groups most of the time when I was presenting this I would want to be there in person to walk the audience through because sometimes there's things in here that are pretty technical and uh, depending on who your audience is, uh, they may not understand everything. So it's good to just be, be there and narrate and uh, add some color where needed. But as you'll notice, it's going to go through. We've got some hyperlinks here. These are all live. I can jump to any section of the report that I want at any time. I'm going to scroll through it just to kind of touch on the things that are within it. We've got, this is the executive summary from the App Doctor. So it's putting different things that are from our, our different tools. It's adding them to the report. We've got our tier pair circle showing the data exchanged. Uh, data exchange chart. So this is great in helping our audience understand the flow of that on the wire of that transaction as it hits the wire. App Doctor summary of delays. So everything we just seen that I just went through is contained within this report. So very nice. But now there's a lot of stuff here. Maybe you don't want all these different views in there. And that's the nice thing about it is you can uh, get rid of views, include or exclude content. It's up to you. It's very flexible. Nice reporting engine. Uh, help share a lot of great information with uh, folks maybe that don't have access to the tool. So on that, I think that's a, a good summary of the Capture Manager that should get most folks up and running, able to take some captures and uh, take a look at those captures. I think this is a good place to stop. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time today, and thanks for choosing Riverbed.